it's so good to see you. And I so appreciate you coming to speak with us on this day. You and I and all of us were each being called to explore new ways to be and lead in our lives during these extraordinary times of tremendous challenges and opportunities. We're each unique gifts who chose to be here now and we're not islands. In fact, we are never alone. We are responsible for the use and abuse of our God-given power to be alive. This special, divinely guided interview with you, Ed Dowd, will explore the current crises with a unique perspective and how to consciously manifest positive transformation from our personal lives to impact the global and more universal co-creation. Hello, for some of you who don't know me, my name is Joyce Anastasia, and I'm the founder of the company Lead by Wisdom and the author of Extraordinary Leadership During Extraordinary Times. Our mission and the focus of my work is to evoke the greatest gifts, benevolent and discerning choices, and ethical ways of being, leading, and co-creating in the world, from individual to companies to nations. I believe we can and do change. We can affect transformation in the world and contribute to shifting the crises helping to make this a better place to be. It is my deepest pleasure and honor to introduce Ed Dowd, a man of deep integrity, conviction, humanity, and faith. He is a man who understands the integration of systems both within our bodies and souls, but within our world as well. His perspective highlights the economic and financial aspects of systems and the crises we face. In this interview, we'll address the current crises, current smoking guns with the research that Ed has done, and the ultimate battle of good versus evil, and the aspects of that that address divinely loving ways to lead and be, and our responsibility to make choices to that end. Ed, this is a crisis of enormous proportions, like a high-speed train that is drone controlled without brakes, and the bulk of humanity is forced to stand on its tracks. Can you please share a summary, summary of your background, your research, and how you got here, how we got here. Sure. My name again is Ed Dowd, and I uh, am a former professional on Wall Street. Uh, I spent many years uh, of my career studying capital markets, uh, studying stocks, currencies, bonds. I began after college, I went to a firm called HSBC, which is a uh, global British bank uh, that uh, was involved all over the globe. And in my job there, my job was to sell fixed income products. Uh, I was based out of Chicago when I was a young man. And I learned how the monetary system works, how the debt systems work, how currencies work, and how they're all interrelated. Um, I wanted to become a stock picker, so I went back to business school to get into the equity business, and uh, I learned a lot about uh, finance as it's taught academically, but it's not how it's actually carried out in the real world. Um, I also learned, uh, we had a great ethics professor, his name was uh, uh, Mike Metzger, and one of the quotes that still haunts me today and is part of the current crisis is this quote, you can't rationalize facts to someone whose position is based on emotion. 
then after uh, business school, I graduated and I went to Wall Street, worked at uh, Donaldson Lufkin and Genrette. Uh, and there I was an equity analyst in electric utilities. And I was there from 1997 through 99. And that's where I saw the dot-com prices begin to unfold. And I saw how the sausage was made on Wall Street. And the scandal then was um, investment banks uh, were dispensing with their usual due diligence because business was so good. And they were just doing deals to make money and the research department was um, promoting those deals. Now I was in electric utilities. I saw it happen. I wasn't part of the, uh, the fraud because uh, the electric utilities were not exciting in 1999. <laughs> um, so I saw how the sausage was made and I saw what went on. Uh, it wasn't called fraud then, but you could, you could sense that something was off. It was the institutional imperative I saw it at DLJ, and other investment banks. It was going on throughout all of Wall Street. Then I um, wanted to go manage money. So I went to become a technology analyst up in Boston at Independence Investments. And there um, I was a very young analyst covering a different sector than I had on Wall Street. But because of my, I guess, early discernment about how the world works in history, I determined that this was a bubble and that bubbles are usually created by loose monetary policy. So I was able to steer my firm out of the way of a lot of the wreckage in the dot-com bubble. They didn't listen to me 100%, but enough so that uh, we did well. Um, and what I, what I determined there was a lot of the firms that had been created were created with uh, junk bond money, easy money. They had no revenues, but there were lots of projections for uh, in the future. And a lot of the dot-com um, spending was due to these newly created companies called CELEX. And for some reason, because of my background in, in fixed income and equities and learning equities, I realized that debt markets drive equities to the, for the most part. And it was not hard for me to figure out that the dot-com bubble was going to go bust because the Fed was then raising interest rates at the time in the uh, in '99 into 2000, and that choked off the credit. The companies that were buying all these uh, technologies from all these other companies um, started to go bankrupt, and then the whole thing fell apart. And then the great frauds like Enron and WorldCom were exposed. So that's where I figured out there was a cycle to these uh, things that the monetary system creates um, boom and bust. Initially in the boom, they lower interest rates, uh, pump money into the banking system that then gets lent, uh, and they keep the punch bowl uh, usually around too long, and then the monies that are lent eventually turn into fraud somewhere. You don't know where the fraud ends up, but it usually presents itself somewhere in the system. So that was corporate fraud in the late 90s. Um, and then we, the Fed, then after 50% correction in the stock market in 9-11, the Fed uh, lowered interest rates considerably and the cycle began anew. Money printing began, lending began. And this time the bubble snaked its way into real estate. And there was a real estate boom, as many of you remember in the early 2000s. Yeah. And the, the mantra then in, in the dot-com crisis, the, the, the catchphrase was, um, uh, it's a new paradigm. So the catchphrase in the uh, real estate crisis that was brewing was home prices never go down. So we built a whole system over the next six years around uh, fraudulent mortgage backed bonds that Wall Street created and sold to insurance companies and investors. And the fraud was perpetuated through easy money and then eventually a corruption of the rating agencies. These are third party independent verifiers of um, the soundness of the bonds, which were then sold to institutions that wanted safety but yield. So they bought these AAA bonds thinking that, that they were gonna be fine. Fast forward, the AAA bonds were not fine and they ended up going down 60, 70%. And that's because home prices did go down, even though that mantra was home prices never go down. That was the belief system in that fraud. And um, 
because the fraud had moved from corporations onto banks, investment banks produced these bonds. They sold them to banks. They sold them to insurance companies. It was a, a systemic problem. And we had the great financial crisis when the Fed started to raise interest rates again. Credit became tight. And then the fraud was exposed. And then it all started to unwind. And what happened to the fraud that was um, perpetrated uh, from you know, 2001 through 2007? That fraud was then bought by the central banks onto their balance sheets. Where is that fraud today? It's still there. That fraud never disappeared. I call it the uniparty political system, the Democrats and the, and the, the GOP, the Republicans. They, they work for the same folks. Those folks are corporations and, and moneyed interests. They create laws and pretend that there's um, controversy, but there really isn't. They're both about getting political donations, getting bribes, getting... Uh, uh, monies and, 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 and things of interest for their families and themselves. And so uh, a total conflict of interest, puppets on strings sort of scenario. Correct. And that's, that's been going, it's been going on forever. Um, and so then uh, roll forward. So for the last 12 years, the central bankers have really been running the show and politicians have been spending like drunken sailors to keep the economy kind of muddling along. And the last 12 years has been a tale of two cities. Uh, those who are close to the printing machine, meaning the central banks benefited. So if you were a large um, a hedge fund owner, your, your assets were pumped up, you were able to make a lot of money because you charge a percent of, a percent of fees. And uh, if the markets go up, you get 20% of the profits. You know They weren't in on this, they just benefited from it. If you were in the C-suite of a corporation, the money printing enabled your stock prices to forever rise. And so you issued yourself stock options. So the rich became wit, rit, uh, richer and the rest just kind of muddled along. So the last 12 years have been kind of a zombie economy. But the problem was over the last 12 years, this fraud never really got dealt with in the great financial crisis. So they papered over it. And, uh, and as you know, in great money printings, the printing of this money created fraud in government and fraud at the central banks. And so the debt bubble, debt bubble has gotten so big that myself and a bunch of other people in the financial industry started to think about uh, how would this manifest? How would this global debt collapse manifest? Because it has to manifest because the global uh, monetary system is based on uh, our fiat currencies, a, a debt-based monetary system. So what that means is you print money, but that money has to be lent. So it's constant credit creation. Yeah. And it needs constant flow and constant growth. Any disruption to that growth causes it to contract. So they knew eventually um, that the system would become unhinged uh, somewhere in the globe. Some country would go bankrupt and set off a daisy chain of events. So we were all trying to figure out when the bubble would end and how it would end and how it would manifest. We all, we all suspected that it would end with currencies uh, some countries' currencies becoming in crisis and would lead to war. In October of 2019, there was, uh, uh, we could see a, a slowing of global growth. There was a, what's called a repurchase agreement crisis between the Fed and the banks. It's overnight money lent between banks and institutions and central banks. And this lending, uh, um, spiked up all of a sudden in, uh, in September, October of 2019. So we knew something was coming. The, 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 we call it the plumbing of the system. The overnight uh, lending is the guts of the system upon which all the leverage is built. And then curiously enough, COVID came along uh, right on time. And then the Fed had cover or an excuse and the other central banks had cover and an excuse to go on unprecedented monetary uh, printing binges. The Fed increased the money supply 65% in 2020. That's the largest uh, percent increase in the money monetary system ever in the history of the Fed. And it was done under the guise of um, emergency measures. The Fed then was able to also give, it gave itself, uh, along with some approval from Congress, measures to buy corporate credit because that was the problem in the fall of 2019. Uh, corporate credit markets were becoming un unhinged. So they were able to buy credit and they were able to um, uh, stabilize the system for a couple more years. Well, that was 2020, today's 2022. 
And you see what you see going on now are financial markets becoming unhinged, credit markets becoming unhinged, currency markets becoming unhinged. And the, the actual reason why is we're at the end of the system and they can no longer control it. And we do have inflation, but the inflation I'm here to tell you is not monetarily monetary inf inflation, it's supply chain inflation. It's, it's because of all the mistakes we made during COVID, all the intentional energy policy by the Biden administration and the uh, European Union uh, governments, and also the Ukraine war. So the inflation we're seeing is due to um, those policies. In addition, some things I'm gonna talk about in a little bit in terms of disability from the COVID vaccines, which is causing a labor shortage. So what we're seeing is inflation, but it's not monetary inflation. It's, it's supply side inflation. And the Fed is now undertaking what we call an interest rate hike cycle. They actually shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and that's because the dollar um, against all other currencies is rising. And what you need to know about that is in every commodity cycle, the dollar usually goes down when commodities go up because that's what inflation is. It's, it's too many dollars chasing too few goods. Well, this time, this is the first commodity cycle we've had where the dollar and the commodity index, which is known as the CRB, has gone up 211%. By the way, that's the largest percent increase ever in a commodity cycle advance. It's been swift and fast and brutal. I was very suspicious of the vaccines because I only knew two things at the time that they were uh, introduced. One, that uh, typical vaccine safety measures, it takes seven to 10 years to vet all the safety data before you usually get approval. Uh, the approval was so swift, I was very suspect. And also Operation Warp Speed alarmed me because any, anything that's done at Operation Warp Speed suggests to me that uh, safety corners are cut uh, normal protocols are ignored. I have a whistleblower, Brooke Jackson, that I've talked to. She has talked about uh, un the unblinding of her patients. So we, we saw fraud from her and more and more fraud is coming out as more is revealed. Then uh, the FDA in the fall of 2021 took the unprecedented step of suggesting that those who wanted to see the clinical trial data because it was asked for by a group of doctors that that data could not be seen for 75 years. So- Could I, could I interject just for a minute to sure. kind of summarize what you're attempting to bring out and have spoken of before? So it's my understanding that what you're saying is that the pandemic was in service to distract from the financial collapse that is correct. in front of correct. us. Correct. And, and it, lots, lots of people ask me, was it planned or it doesn't matter. What, all we need to prove right now, it's being used as an excuse to provide cover. Um, so back, to the, back to the clinical trials, because this is important. So if it was in service of the support of distracting from the financial collapse, then there is a rationale or a understanding of why then would there be fraud related to the vaccines? So so continue with what you were saying about Correct. the so, fraudulent. Right. So the fraud, it, it could have been intentional or, 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 or uh, mistaken, meaning that the agenda is this. They need to, because of the financial collapse, you need to have a system of control to prevent people from rioting and traveling and getting uppity about the fact that their pensions and a lot of what they viewed as the world as they knew it is now gone. So the vaccines, in my belief, were um, uh, rushed to provide a system of control, meaning vaccine passports, restriction of travel, and so you could make the case that the fraud was intentional or unintentional, but it was, it was the end result because the system wanted to have vaccine passports and, and control over the population and using the virus as an excuse to shut down certain activities like protests, gatherings, keep people isolated, 
during a financial crisis. So they and they're in fear about a virus rather than a fear that the system's collapsing because of the politicians and the central bankers. If you're a central banker and a politician, would you want to admit that the system that you've created the last 12 years is imploding? Would you want to take the rap for that? No, you would not. And so the incentives to prevent uh, that from coming to light were there. And the incentives to use COVID as a convenient excuse to implement controls and print money were there. So they took, we, we can, we'll find out eventually whether this was a planned event or an excuse. Um, we don't need to know that right now. All we need to know is they took advantage of the crisis to divert attention from the financial collapse and to implement uh, control systems under the guise of medical help <laughs> uh, for our own benefit. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because the proof for me, um, one of the things I saw early on was on April 5th of 2020, uh, a Federal Reserve President, James Bullard, uh, he's the president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve. He got on Face the Nation. And this is only a month after the lockdowns. And he was asked the question, well, how do we turn the economy back on? People will be scared. They won't want to shop. They won't want to go anywhere. They won't want to go to work. And he said, well, due to technology, we have the ability now to test people and we can provide immunity badges and they can get tested every couple of weeks. And we, and then uh, the, spe the, the, the segment ended and then the, uh, the host said, well, when we come back, we'll talk about the surveillance technologies available now to monitor that. So this was floated as an idea in April of 2020. If you roll forward into the summer of 2020, I was and others were talking about the coming vaccine passports. We were called conspiracy theorists. Well, sure enough, that became a real thing. Um, the vaccines um, also we're gonna make people a lot of money. Uh, just to give you an idea, the, kind of, the amount of money that um, Pfizer stood to make, it doesn't look like they're gonna make that right now because the vaccine program, it's got problems as we know. Um, the idea was to uh, vaccinate uh, the globe and if Pfizer got 50% of the market share, which I think is reasonable to assume, and the goal, the, 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 what they wanted to do was to get us on quarterly boosters. So I, I did the simple math and that would have uh, annually give Pfizer, if they got 50% of, I assume 5 billion humans would get vaccinated. That would give them revenues of 350 billion. Their revenue before COVID was 40 billion. Think about that, 40 billion to 350 billion. So if you don't think there was enough incentive for them to cut corners, get anything they wanted through and not care about the safety results, uh, I can tell you, you're naive. Uh, and if you don't think there was enough money to bribe politicians in countries, to bribe politicians in the US, you're naive. The money and the prize was so big. This is what, and they have a history and a track record of doing this. They were convicted in the early 2000s of bribing doctors to push pharmaceutical sales. They had the biggest fine ever. So this is part of their corporate policy as far as I'm concerned. I remember driving around Maui and hearing ads uh, before it was actually approved by the FDA. It was authorized. They, they didn't get approval till later in the, in the, in the fall of 2021. But during the uh, early months of the vaccination program, on the radio here, they were saying, get, get your vaccine. It's approved by the FDA. So there was fraud. There was fraudulent advertising. And then let's go back to the two frauds I talked about before. Uh, corporate fraud, it was a, you know, um, a new paradigm, okay? Real estate fraud, uh, home prices never go down. This fraud, safe and effective. So every fraud has a catchphrase to yes. make people feel good. And this, this yes. catchphrase was safe and effective. Uh, I have a lot of proof that shows not only is it not safe, it's killed uh, a large number of our countrymen and it continues to um, injure many, many people, which will have effects globally and in the US for I think uh, decades to come. This is, uh, this is a big problem. Um, so that, that's, kind of, that's kind of the summary of the financial aspects uh, the, you know, why uh, the prize was so big, how you could see that so many institutions 
would sign up for this because money was to be made. You don't need to be, you don't need to imagine a bunch of, um, you know, old fat white men in the back room laughing, you know, evilly smoking cigars. Money incentivizes people to do things against, and they may not even know, they just wanted to make money. And so they, they went along with it and not everybody saw the big picture. Um, so this, this is, uh, you know, the, the other thing that came to light was uh, this year we found out that the mainstream media received over a billion dollars in money from the US government to push the vaccines and not promote counter narratives or anything negative about the vaccines. Yes, and I knew, I knew of someone personally who was hired by a gigantic PR firm in 2020, before it even began, before it even began, to promote whatever it is that was the agenda of control through mass media. So right. it, it millions of dollars was spent on this PR firm before it was even announced that there was a pandemic. So it it's very nefarious. And it's it's horrific to watch. And as you and I have spoken of before, we we talked about um, Dr. Matthias Desmet, who t who speaks of mass formation. I'm going to say hypnosis, even though the original term was psychosis. This is an absolute cut into human psychology, extracting from psychological processes that were explored back during Nazi Germany. Correct. And, and this is related to when people feel lonely or alone and they're in a place of fear with all the fear porn that was poured into our multimedia. Clients that I have were in total fear. People who normally would not respond that way they had to recalibrate within their own being how can i be in service in the world and how can i reconnect with something and they were in fact propagandized to as you and i spoke of and you said this as a, an interesting formation of this new agenda related to vaccines the whole manifestation of this has become a religion in and of itself. Correct. And in doing so, people are connected. Even the most intelligent people in the world have been mass formation, hypnotically connected through fear porn. So with that, what, what do you think can be kind of a countermeasure to that because if there are so many and there are approximately 60 percent of the population who has fallen prey to that let me say prey to this mass hypnosis because of internet and the social media being co-opted what what do you think ed in your observations would be a great countermeasure to that so you know, this is at first when this started happening last year, I, I used the term, it's an IQ problem. And then I had to change that because it's not an IQ problem. As you said, I know very smart people that have fallen for this. It's a discernment issue. And, and what does that mean? Discernment is, you know, in your guts and your soul that something is not truthful and you feel it and you know it and you, you're very suspicious. And a lot of people have lost discernment in this case, because what do, what do we know? We do know that intelligence agencies have bragged in Reuters and AP articles about how they propagandized their populations early on in COVID to make them fearful, to get compliance. They, they bragged about this. This, this is not conspiracy. This is in Reuters and AP. The, the, you know, so this is, so, so if that, if they admit to that, we know there's more behind the curtain. Okay. So, 
So they disarmed a large portion of the population with fear and fear and emotions override logic and, 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 and disarm people. So a lot of people got in fear um, and they believed everything they heard to be true. And then they looked at anybody that didn't agree with that narrative as selfish and crazy and conspiracy theorists. So where are we today? So I have discernment, you have discernment. There's a lot of people with discernment. Um, what has happened since this unfolded in the early stages of uh, 2021? Unfortunately, we have now knowledge. So we, I had discernment, now I have knowledge. What's the knowledge? The knowledge is peoples are dying and the bodies are showing up in different forms and databases. Despite the, main, main, the, the mainstream narrative, there's a counter narrative that's the truth. And so there are people like myself and others that are exposing this truth. And so the goal is, I have discernment, many people do. The people with discernment need to spread the knowledge that fraud has occurred, that life insurance companies reported 40% increase in all-cause mortality in working age people. So in year one of the pandemic, it was old people that mostly died. In year two, we had what we call a mix shift on Wall Street to, mo to mostly young, uh, people that shouldn't be dying from COVID. And that happened and insurance companies are paying out large sums of money. We also have the VAERS database, the DOD leaks. We have um, CDC databases when you break it out by age that showed um, you know, the millennial age cohort spiking to a new excess mortality into the fall of 2021. We have funeral home companies. So the, the data is everywhere. And anecdotally, uh, people are starting to like realize something's not there. So we, need, we have the, so I have the knowledge, you have the knowledge, the knowledge is out there. So what's the goal? The goal then is to take this knowledge and then you have to have the guts to act and take action. And this is where everybody comes in. This is how we change the world. Everybody has to do their part. And that doesn't mean you have to be me and be out in front. I've gotten uh, to the grace of God, my voice has risen. So I'm, I'm doing what he's directing me to do. But everybody has a responsibility to get off the bleachers into the playing field. And what does that mean? That means convincing a loved one to look at this knowledge. And it's different from a bunch of doctors yelling at each other. This is hardcore data of bodies piling up. And uh, I also wanna share that recently we discovered about two, three weeks ago, uh, a database in the US government, it's from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's the household survey, it's the monthly employment report where they ask about disability. And disability um, since the vaccination introduction is up 3 million. It was 29 million for about five years. Now it's at 30, close to 33 million. That's a 10% increase in one year. The only thing that changed in 2021 was the vaccine. Young people didn't decide to mysteriously start dying in the second half of 21. And a lot of my naysayers will say, well, it's deaths of despair. It's the lockdowns caused suicides, depression, drug abuse. Well, the lockdowns occurred in 2020, not the fall of 2021. Um, uh, group life policies, which is a very specialized unit of life insurance companies, are policies of working people that are currently employed by corporations. They get a death benefit. It's kind of a throwaway thing that none of us ever cared about in our careers because none of us thought we were going to die in our 20s and 30s and 40s or even 50s. Yeah. Um, they also, so, so the people that died that the insurance companies are paying out all these claims for are young. Yeah. And in the fall of 2021, uh, into the uh, Q4 as well, the insurance companies saw this great uptick. And you cannot say to me that everyone decided in the third and fourth quarter of last year the, those who were employed decided to commit suicide at the same time. There was no mass suicide I heard about. Not all these people that are employed uh, overdosed on fentanyl, heroin, and opioids. People who overdose on those drugs, generally speaking, are not employed with the death benefit, okay? So we have this knowledge. We know what's going on. Uh, we have not, Dr. Naomi Wolf and her team of 2,000 professionals that have volunteered their time going over the Pfizer data releases and yeah. what we're finding is shocking it is fraud and and the safety data is garbage so what is going on why isn't the government stepping in because there's too many people involved they have to they have to triple down uh and keep going so we have the knowledge we have to convince people uh one by one 
Some of us have bigger voices than others, but you have to act. Go to a, go to a rally, convince a loved one, tell a doctor. We can no longer be rooting for people like me behind the screen saying, go get them, Ed. We all have to go get them. And I don't mean violently, I mean with knowledge and love and understanding. And some people are not gonna respond to this knowledge and you know, pray for them. Um, if they keep getting boosted, the outcome is, uh, the prognosis is uh, grim if you keep con continuing to get these shots. So Ed, you had brought up this notion, this quote at the beginning about ethics and emotion. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is connected right here. I think it's very connected. So if people can speak to the emotional impact of what is going on, it might help to open up people's hearts again, remind them of how can we come together in critical thinking to, to do this. So you, you kindly sent me images of charts that I'd like you to review because I think this is really important. You've already given a summary of these, sure. um, but I would love for you to review these. And also I want to say that one of your gifts and why your voice is being called upon now is because you have trained yourself and you have this gift innately, it seems, to see patterns, to see patterns in the system and to see this fraud over time. Most of us don't have either the time or that capacity as a gift. So this is a huge gift that you're bringing into the world to see this pattern. Like some people see it in bodies. We have a holistic body. If we get hurt somehow, if we have cancer, let's say, it's not just one little piece that gets extracted but it's from the whole system's point of view that we can heal right i believe invariably that this is what's going on in our world systemically you affect one thing you were saying the reason perhaps for the distraction of the pandemic is because the financial system is collapsing because of fraud so where do we attack it? We don't, we don't cut off an arm. We have to get to the whole head of it. We have to address the whole system and you are doing it through your discernment of patterns of fraud. So with that, if you can show us these things and I will put a screen share and pop these charts up. Okay, this is a great chart. So a little background, um, when I started my journey in February and started to get my 15 minutes of fame, in one of my first interviews on the Steve Bannon's War Room, uh, an ex, uh, I said I was going to look at insurance company results. And an ex-Wall Street insurance analyst who used to, um, he was number one institutional investor ranked, he worked for a Wall Street bank and he wrote research covering life insurance companies. He was there for seven years. He reached out to me and we started to team up and we looked at all the financial results from the insurance industry in the fourth quarter and we found alarming, alarming things. Roll forward about a month after that, he was, he was mucking around in the CDC data, uh, the all-cause mortality data, which is a government database online. Now they, they lumped it all together as um, all ages and that, told a, a disturbing story, but not the whole story. And that story, excess mortality went you know, up into the end of 2020. And then again, almost to a new high in uh, the fall and, and winter of 2021, but not quite. He was able to take the data and break it down by age cohort. And uh, he created, uh, he has actuarial training. So he took the uh, baseline data uh, you derive excess data from a baseline. So the baseline data was between the years of 2016 and 2019. So these deaths I'm referring to are excess above what we saw 
between 16 and 19. And what we saw when we broke it down by age cohort was what we call the smoking gun. Ages 25 to 44 is the chart you see before you. Let's, let, generally speaking, you can call those millennials, roughly. And you can see that we had a spike in the end of 2020, uh, and then vaccines started to get rolled out. They spiked a little bit. And then into the mandate uh, um, season of last year, when Biden on September 9th uh, declared the um, corporate mandates, and corporations were already starting to mandate, we saw an alarming, what we call rate of change spike in excess mortality in this age cohort, 25 to 44, into the fall, uh, August, September, October, when everybody had to decide between keeping their job or not taking the vax. And, and my, rate, many of my clients were experiencing that very thing. They would say, what do I do? What do I do here? And uh, sharing data was very important at the time. Go ahead. Yeah, so you can see that spike is just not, I mean, it, you know, if you use deductive reasoning and logic, what, what changed? Vaccination. So let, let's reverse the logic. Let, in, in year two of a pandemic with, a, let's, let's assume the, ver the vaccine was a miracle vaccine. If it was a miracle, Shouldn't that be going towards zero in year two of a pandemic that is forcing everybody? Yes, it should. So let's, but you turn that logic on its head and that's what I just said, you see a spike up. Again, the only thing that's changed here for this age cohort is a vaccination, mass vaccination program that occurred for the whole country and you can see it in the numbers. Uh, between March of 2021 and February of 2022, when we did this analysis, that was 61,000 excess millennial deaths, 61,000. To put some um, meat uh, on those bones, that's a Vietnam War that occurred for the millennials in, in one year. The Vietnam War killed 58,000 over 10 years. That's how many troops we lost. I think, Part of the um, reason why we've seen COVID kind of disappear, the Biden administration declared the pandemic over is because unfortunately, the evidence of the crime started showing up and that's the bodies and, and the disability. And uh, so they, they kind of had to put it on pause. So Pfizer's dreams of quarterly boosters forever doesn't seem to be taking hold, but they're not going to admit to this crime and they're still uh, mandating it for kids so they can get a, a legal liability on a go forward basis. Because once you get it on the child's vaccination schedule, you don't get it. You, you're not held liable. And that's why they decided to harm babies for themselves. So, that, I mean, that's the only that's the only thing I can I can, you know, they're doing it to cover their butt. Yes, and, and because of your diligence, and we'll get to uh, the, the rationale for you to bring this out now, but to your credit of due diligence around what's going on, I'm going to flip to the next chart, this one about the disabilities. This is right. really important because this, more than anything from what I am looking at with data and you know, I've been researching this since 2020 for all sorts of reasons, um, not the least of which is helping people to lead when lead their lives in a way that's healthiest when the intention was anything else but health for any of this coming into the forefront. And disabilities is a unfortunate, horrible uh certainly a criminal act against our population. So go ahead and speak to this chart, if you would. Right. So this is straight from the government's website. It's the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's the disability survey. And um, I don't have the longer term chart, but you can see prior to the vaccinations, uh, it was running around, you know, between, you know, somewhere around 29 million. And, and, and for five years prior to that, it had there, you know, the, the, the trend had been up prior to uh, five years ago or I, I, yeah, uh, the prior five years, but it leveled off here 
And then uh, we saw the spike down. We can't explain that spike down into the vaccination. We think there was some disruption in the household survey and some things going on in 2020. But ever since the vaccines were uh, introduced, it, I, uh, you can see it just took off in January of uh, January, February of 2021 and hasn't stopped. And the trend is continuing up. And the trend, and again, rate of change is important. What is rate of change? That's the slope of the line. You can see the slope of that increase is very steep. So that's the rate of change, which is indicative that a trend has started and it's strong. Okay, let me say that again. When we have a rate of change like this, if, I was, if this was a stock, if this was a stock chart, and I could figure out a couple of reasons why that trend was occurring, I would buy that stock and do more research, okay? And then as my thesis would get proven, I'd buy more and more. So this is what I would do for a living. I would buy that trend. So that trend I see there, I would buy disability as a stock. And I don't mean that to sound um, you know, cruel. I'm saying that because of my training, that's a trend. And that's a trend that's not gonna stop anytime soon unless the vaccination program stops. So that's my opinion. So in a sense, you're saying because you are trained in pattern recognition, you're seeing this as an indicator of a good uh, of a forecast that you can yes stick your stick your mark on and say right. if I yes if I wanted to go long death and disability and that was a security I'd be long those two and make a lot of money. I'm just saying that to prove that this is what my training trained me to do to make money for my clients well i'm trying to help humanity and this trend that i see it started with the vaccinations it's up 10 percent in one year 10 percent that's three million additional americans are now identifying voluntarily as disabled now i i believe this number is probably low okay yeah. and i think i think uh we we actually i didn't give you these two charts we broke it down by data by, by gender, I mean, and women are up 30% in one year. So, and now we think that has something to do with the fact that men don't like to admit things, but huh, uh, the women, women seem to be disproportionately dis more disabled than men at the moment. Um, and this has huge ramifications for our society. Like you and I alluded to earlier, a death is a tragic thing, but uh, a death is a death and, and life goes on. When someone's disabled and they can't care for themselves or work, your life changes. And you have to, you know, the people that are taking care of the disabled have to take time off from work if they can't afford to put them somewhere. Um, the, the disabled, you know, are just effectively taken out of society. They're put in, if they can, lucky enough to get a disability claim, then that's a financial burden on the system. Mm -hmm. And that also takes a laborer out of the workforce, causing inflation because there's less people around to take jobs. Mm -hmm. So this is um, this is part of the inflation problem. That's the deaths and the disability are causing a labor shortage. It's not what they the, the narrative they're trying to present is they call it the great resignation. I don't know what that means. It's just a catchword that people decided that they want to not work. I mean, most people need to work to survive. So this is not the great resignation. This is death and disability. That's causing the worker under supply issue that many of your CEO and senior VP clients who don't have the, the background that I do, they don't see it yet, but hopefully they watch this video and they figure it out. Yeah, exactly. And so with this as a predictor for you know, forecasting that disabilities are on the rise, and this is not a good thing. This is not the sign of a healthy economy, nor the sign of a healthy societal trend. How would you, uh, or what would you do recommendation-wise for people in the world, both at a common everyday level and those who are in the system that is creating this issue? Uh, you mean from a health perspective or, or, or an, a call to action? Call to action. So the call to action is this. If you're in the system and you were unaware of this, you're probably what we call compartmentalized. You don't know that you were part of something that was doing this. If you have access to data that could blow the whistle on this, 
become a whistleblower and we need chain of custody on the data. Um, it, that's number one. Number two, if you're not in the system that's perpetuating this, um, you need to alert others uh, through the educational process and also talking about the fear. Like, look, I know you were in fear and you, and you thought this is the right thing to do, but um, the solution to your fear is actually harming you more than it's going to remove. It, it has di more dire consequences on your health than the actual fear you had of the virus. And I think that's the way you need to come at it. The virus, come at it with simple facts. The virus survivability rate is 90, 99.7%. Um, the vaccine uh, far outweighs any benefits of, of, of protecting you. Well, first of all, even if you get the virus, it's just not that harmful. The vaccine is likely an order of magnitude more harmful to you than getting COVID. It just is. Yeah. And that, that's being borne out in the numbers. And the other thing I would like to say is if you have loved ones that are on board with this program and they're in the COVIDian religion, you just have to continue to press on them not to get boosters and point out obvious facts like why would you get a booster for something that doesn't work? That's the definition of insanity. And then they'll say back to you, well, it, you know, if I get COVID, it, it could, it, it, you know, at least it won't be as bad as it could be. And then you ask them, what study do you have to show that? Because as far as I know, there's no studies that indicate that the vaccines do anything like that. And there are no studies. I've looked. It's just, it's a tagline. It's a tagline like I heard in the pharmaceutical SSRI industry, you have a chemical imbalance. That's never been proven. Again, these are marketing things. Mm -hmm. These are marketing sales tactics. And unless you can show me a study that proves that um, it makes your um, uh, symptoms and your chance of uh, hospitalization lower, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. So at this point, I would like to take a deeper dive into this whole notion of taking responsibility for our lives versus it's really easy to blame. It's really important to identify the facts and the knowledge that, that we're all bringing forward, that those who have been whistleblowers and putting their lives on the line, including, you know, you, ha you just had your Twitter account shut down, being censored in certain ways. We are beings of light, but we also have shadow. And this is, we live in a dual world. How have you transformed in your life in ways that shifted from something, let's say, nefarious, if you consciously did something nefarious, or even unconscious and moving into a different way of being. And I'm going to give an extreme example because I have clients who have done horrific things in the past who have shifted and it's very hard to shift. They say it's one of the hardest things. And you said you cannot change the world without changing yourself. Right? Correct. So, so here's the example. An extreme example. Individuals might wonder why they found themselves or find themselves being leaders in a mafia, never ever intending to join in the first place. How do you shift from all of a sudden seeing yourself as a leader in a mafia and, and step backward <laughs> to a different way of being? Go ahead. Well, I wasn't in the mafia. I was just, I was no, going I know to. You were. No, no, I know you weren't. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Not at all. No, I'm just giving an example. Of yeah, no, I got it. People I know who have been, and it's, it's a horrible thing trying to get out. So go ahead. Sure. So what uh, my life was typical of a lot of people's upbringing, you know, you, the American dream, uh, competition making money, getting the girl, all these, pro you know, cash and prizes, right? And, uh, you know, 
God, I was brought up Catholic, but God was kind of in the background. I went to Notre Dame, which is a Catholic uni uh, university, one of the most premier ones. I didn't go to mass once until graduation. So that could, tells you my spirituality was uh, not, not active at Notre Dame. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I uh, had a successful career on Wall Street. I um, also uh, enjoyed food and drink. And over time, um, you know, I became a gluttonous uh, Wall Street professional, very self-satisfied, uh, full of myself, ego. And um, I eventually uh, got depressed personally because I was lacking in something and I didn't know what it was. And um, I was always blaming other people for my problems, never blamed myself, never looked at myself, never looked at anything that was wrong with me. It was always someone else that was at fault. Uh, it was my partner. It was my, my um, then wife who was nagging me too much. It was whatever it was. It was never me. So unless my life was going perfect, I got very frustrated because I was a control freak. Um, then I got depressed. Uh, a series of uh, unfortunate events occurred and I became depressed, went into the pharmaceutical aspect of this. You know, I had a psychiatrist and a therapist and they put me on some drugs. The drugs made me worse because the drugs don't make you look at yourself. They, it's a pill. It's a magic pill that allows you to feel better magically. Well, not only did these magic pills not make me feel better, they actually made me clinically depressed to the point where I had to go check myself into an expensive, fancy, um, like an executive getaway place to get better. And luckily I had a friend who's a psychiatrist who came to me and said, Ed, uh, you're not any of these things they diagnosed you as. You are a just a normal human being who needs to uh, get off these drugs and uh, get some spirituality and that's what i did i i i got i eventually realized that all my depression and my victimhood and 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 everything that was going on in my life was due to me i was my own worst enemy i manifested through negative thoughts and negative energy and bad diet and no exercise i manifested what happened to me and th it wasn't anybody's fault but mine um, and once I realized that, and I started to put faith in God, meaning like I used to worry about things that were not um, real, imaginary worries about the future, uh, dwell on the past. I was not a present moment person. I would have a conversation with you if I had known you back then and not remember a word you said. Um, you fast forward to me today. I don't really dwell much in the future and I don't dwell much in the past. I listen to people. And I'm known in my friend group as the guy who remembers everything everybody says because I listen. So my memory is actually, I would say, 50 fold better than it was pre depression because I was still in my head concerned about what people thought of me. Did I have enough money? Was my job good enough? Does my wife still like me? All this nonsense. Um, and so I had to go through a tremendous amount of pain. My, I start my background substantiates that I, I feel the same way. It's very, very challenging for me to watch the profession of psychology and psychiatry having been so co-opted by, by something that you take in instead of changing from the inside out. So right, going. right. And so, um, you know, so I'm, we moved to Maui in 2014, my wife and I. Unfortunately, the marriage didn't survive, but that's okay. Um, she's a great mom, great, wonderful person. I have three lovely children. And since 2014, I've been on a journey of healing and self-awareness and be very aware of my character defects and, you know, what they are. And I watch my thoughts. I'm, a, I'm an observer of my thoughts. And when I have negative thoughts, I, I stop myself and say, God, please remove these negative thoughts. And when you just acknowledge them, they usually disappear. Because I've come to understand we have, um, we have the brain. It's a tool. It's a chemical tool. And we have the mind, consciousness. If your brain hijacks the mind, which it can do, and that's what led to my depression. It was, it, it was negative thoughts run wild that shut me down. If you let your thoughts run you, you will program yourself and manifest awful things over time. I mean, I've seen it time and time again. And so I try not to think negative things. I try to be an optimist. 
Um, I pray, I mean, I think part of the reason I'm here is I prayed to be of service. And then through coincidences, I'm now elevated to a point of um, sharing the message of truth and what's going on. And this journey is interesting because uh, if I was, if I was who I was 15 years ago doing this journey, I would be full of ego. And I would be, um, I would not have the ability to take criticism. I would not have the ability to work with others that have an agenda. Because I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do with no agenda and no ego, I'm able to kind of um, avoid all the slings and arrows that come at me and just stay focused. And I don't, you know, people can criticize me all, all, I, all they want. Uh, I have the truth behind me and I, my ego doesn't get bruised if you don't like me. It's okay. I mean, I have truth. If you don't like my message, that's fine. I'm, I'll, I'll be okay. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that wasn't the person I was um, 15 years ago. And I think a, a lot of people that are struggling with whether to uh, educate others are struggling with being, they're, they, they, they want to be liked. And, you know, truth sometimes uh, has to be spoken and you will not be liked for the truth. But we're at a time now where you cannot worry about someone not liking you because that's their own problem. It's not yours. All you're doing is trying to help them. And um, so I, I've undertaken a great journey of um, self-discovery. And I believe that the, the, there's three components to us as beings. There's the mental, there's the physical, which is, you know, health and the spiritual. And when, I, when you have all three working together, meaning mental, I, I control my thoughts. I don't let myself program myself. Physical, I take good care of my avatar, my body, eat well, exercise, meditate, Wim Hof breathing, ice baths, you name it. And then uh, spiritual, I touch in with God and I try to help others and be of service to others. That's kind of where my head is at in my life. Yeah, and I appreciate your transparency because we all have times where we you know, stumble and fall and we make choices that aren't the best choices for us, for our optimal health and the health of the planet. And additionally, one of the things that I love about what you bring into the world is a balance of being discerning. There's a difference between being judgmental and being discerning about what is going on in the world. And you, you and I also talked about this before, and that is if we are operating out of a divinely loving act, we're likely not to allow fear to run the show or an unhealthy ego to run the show, but instead to have a healthy ego to bring us forward and help us to manifest what is the best co-creation, the best life we could live. So with all of that you have in a way become a mentor and we we do go in cycles it's not always perfect we will make mistakes going forward this is naturally a part of being human oh yeah i, I i'm flawed <laughs> <laughs> and we all are yeah. we all are flawed but um it is my uh belief in my experience with people that if people can keep this ethical understanding and that loving action in mind then what comes out of it will be the best outcome at the time even if it might not look very pretty um so with that I, there's another thing i want to ask you because this is so it's it's been coming up a lot there are people who are whistleblowers who genuinely come from a place of where their beings have uh, their life path has emerged and said i have to make a different choice i have to speak up about this and then there are others who want to be some kind of hero in in the world and quote unquote save the world and i am wondering you know there's an importance to to that path of the hero's journey, the heroine's journey. But what if, what if instead it's not about extending three minutes of fame, but instead about the type of person you wish to become is at the core of it. Then 
having just gotten through with Father's Day, I, I just can't even imagine how your children feel about the transformation they have witnessed in you and how you have become a mentor to them and for them in, in a beautifully positive way. So I want to first celebrate that and honor that in you. And I also want to ask you, what kind of miraculous manifestation has happened because of that, because of your change in choice uh, to be more discerning about not being selfish or egoic or, you know, I'm the Wall Street guru, but to instead have this beautiful balance between putting the different kind of face mask on yourself, not the kind of mask we're forced to put on, but the breathing in of the oxygen, the taking care of yourself in balance with being in service to others. So examples of how you've manifested and manifested miracles and some of the things that have happened in your life since that those changes. So um, that's a good question. So let me talk about my kids. My, I, you know, I've included my kids in my journey, telling them a little bits and pieces here and there. Um, they're, you know, they, they did get vaccinated, but they're no longer going to get boosters. So that I feel good about that. My ex-wife is done with this as well. And I've been, you know, telling them about the journey when I met Dr. Malone, how we wrote the Malone doctrine for him and my journey through this um, media profile. And then the research that we've, stumbled upon. Um, what's interesting is uh, my son gets it because he's in college. I was having dinner with my two girls and I was explaining to them what's going on. And you know, they, my 14 year old doesn't even know what an economy is. So it's more, it's, it's, but they know I'm, they, they know I'm doing something that is different from what they're hearing and they under, and they, and, and they're intrigued by it because that's the nature of being a kid. Um, you know, you, you, they're often told what to do. And here's their father telling them something that most of society isn't doing. And they're intrigued and they're receptive and open. They don't think I'm crazy. Um, and, and, and I feel really good about that. And my relationship with my kids has never been better. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, in terms of my life, um, you know, again, there's no cash and prizes uh, from doing this work. But what, it, what has happened is my life's opening up in terms of the people I'm meeting. And I was just a guy on Maui on Twitter. Now I'm a, a fellow on Maui who is being sought after by like-minded people from across the globe with different solutions. And because of my message um, and wanting to only associate myself with people that have the same values and discernment, I'm being reached out by someone who wants to disrupt Google, someone who wants to create a new monetary system, um, people that want to talk to me about, you know, and get advice on how do they navigate this. And my biggest piece of advice for people is um, invest in human relationships, human capital. Because if I think what's going to happen, transactional nature-based uh, relationships are going to go the way of the dodo bird over time. And in fact, if you're a billionaire uh, uh, with a lot of p hired help, um, you should invest in personal relationships and, and, and people that can count on you, not because of your money, but because you're a good human being and, and you're going to do service for them and they're going to do service for you and we're going to help each other. So I'm having this wonderful opportunity to meet all sorts of different people and something may come out of it. I don't know what, but I'm just kind of on the journey and discerning and not, you know, jumping into anything headlong right now. Um, right now, the work at hand is to stop the vaccination program. And I, you know, I never, if you had told me in September of last year, I'd be having discussions with senators, I would have told you, you you've lost your mind. I'm, I'm corresponding with senators about the information that I, myself and my partner found for the insurance companies. And we, and again, I, I, I said this earlier, you know, I had discernment, I got the knowledge, and now I'm taking action. I just don't want to be someone running around doing podcasts. Not that there's not, nothing wrong with that and giving information. I'm taking what I know and implementing it into action. And some of the action my partner and I are doing is we sent 100 letters 
uh, to CEOs of insurance companies, life insurance companies, and 50 state regulators. We had some calls. We educated some people. Uh, unfortunately, it's not moving as fast as we would like. So um, we've decided to, um, we have some insurance executives helping us, but they're, you know, they're dealing with what's going on in their corporations, which is this mass formation uh, psychosis, for lack of a better term, or hallucination. Yeah. Um, so it's slow. And so being a man of action and implementing and my knowledge into action, my partner and I decided to engage with some senators to have them write letters to the insurance companies saying, I understand a letter went out. What have you found? So we continue to take action and um, not just inform. So that's, I want to lead by example. I just don't want to be a guy telling you what to do. I'm doing, I'm doing what I said to do yourself. I'm doing it, you know? Yes. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm not just a talking head. Um, I'm, a, I'm someone that is, you know, willing to go testify on the Hill if need be, uh, trying to change minds and, and tr change the flow of capital. If you can change, if I can get the insurance industry to wake up to the fact that they've been defrauded, that'll create what I hope to be a, a mainstream news cycle, then that would then cause many people to scratch their heads that are unaware of our information. So I'm trying to force through just, you know, traditional activist approaches, force action from people who are maybe unwilling to take action by exposing the sunlight on them. Yes, and these are miraculous events that happened to you because you made a conscious choice, a different Correct. conscious choice, right? right? So if you were to, you become an, an inspirational source for people is what I wanna say. And I encourage that to continue to happen while you, you know, spend time with your kids when you need to spend time with them and do the good work in the world of taking these actions on the ground. So you're, you're expanding spiritually, you're expanding um, uh, concretely, kind of bridging <laughs> between the spiritual and the, and the practical. And your children are learning, but not only your children, all the people out here are learning and they can take these actions too. They can speak up, they can help to contact their senators. And perhaps there are letters that can be pre-drafted for them so that they have the verbiage that's important and that they read it and that they know what they're putting forth to others to make this happen. So all these things are really important. What would you say, Ed, in, in closing that would maybe help to evoke further shifts? Uh, what do you suggest for individuals um, regarding manifesting a life that helps them to lead better lives and to contribute in our world, small to large? Okay, let me just do big picture, then I'll go down to individual. Um, this is a, you know, it's a lot. I saw a great video by uh, a former high priest of Satan, who now believes in God. And he talked about the law of attraction. And, uh, and, and the true law of attraction. And it's what I've been talking about, you have to care. And you have to care about the fact and be in acceptance that the world is a certain way. And you have to care, and then you have to get the knowledge about the world and then you have to take action which is guts so it's 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 heart brain guts and um the last part is what i'm trying to do now i i i cared enough to get in the fight i gathered the knowledge to arm myself in the fight and now i'm taking um, action ch to change things and everybody who wants to get in on this fight um the way to do it is to look at yourself and this is the most, I wouldn't be able to do this if I was still full of ego and fear. And if you get to take a, a moral personal inventory of yourself and your character defects and what they are, identify them and try to suppress your ego as much and think I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do for the greater good. And, and when you do that, it's called karma. 
you don't know what's going to come your way, but good things will come if you just are persistent and you stay true to the right thing and not let it worrying about yourself or your ego or your reputation or what, these things that we cling on to that don't matter because what's going on, it's just so profoundly disturbing that our government is, is implementing these tactics on us knowing full well what's going on because they do know full well they're not dumb people and we have whole large groups of professional classes that are either unaware or participating knowingly and this is a this is just maddening to me and i've never seen such a situation where we need to all rise up and the system is collapsing and it's an opportunity it's it's a dangerous what's going on but it's an opportunity to rewrite the rules and come up with something new and you have to it begins with looking at yourself and what, what's really important to you. Is money and status important to you because you have a job tied to this industry that promotes this? You have to ask yourself, where are you gonna be in 10 years? And do you think that system's gonna protect you because you're, you're, you're an unwilling dupe in it? No, you have to take a stand now and look at yourself and what you really care about and then take action. That's kind of what I think we all have to fight the demons within and then go forward from there. And that's what I did. I fought my demons and I don't, it's weird. I don't have any fear. You know, someone has said uh, that this is the ultimate battle between good and evil. And the battle is within oneself. And when people come to a place like you have and others have, and again, it's cyclical, um, and are able to face demons, not hide them, bring them out and to shine light where there are shadows, then you have an opportunity to make these more discerning choices, even if it is a sacrifice in the material world. And sometimes it's a big sacrifice in the material world. And if, you know, I'll just give you a quick example. When I was 14, my dad was in politics. He was trying to go for a second election and his supervisor offered him, said to him, you need to turn a blind eye to an ethical thing that my father couldn't turn a blind eye to. And his best friend said, well, if you don't, then you could say goodbye to your elected position. And my father, to my great joy and pride, chose the ethical choice instead of selling out to a position. And that was when I was 14. And to this day, I learned so much from him in that one choice he made. And he is very proud of that. He's 88 years old, very proud of that still uh, for having made that choice. And not being recognized and falling into the backdrop of being a great father and a great provider and a great person on this planet. So, you know, karma, you're right. Karma um, can happen right here and now. So your, your gifts may come in different forms and others' gifts may come in different forms that are in the unseen realm for a while but maybe hopefully someday we'll get to see all the miraculous things that occur by what we choose you know so what's next for you ed and then we'll well what's next is i continue to do what i'm doing um you know i'm trying to uh start a hedge fund with a friend but it looks like that may not end up going the way we thought um I also am uh, uh, exploring other opportunities right now. And, but you know, the fight, this is the fight. And if I can do something uh, while well, at the same time helping humanity, that would be the best ideal. But I, I, I have a feeling uh, that my life is only gonna get richer. And I don't know how that manifests, whether it's, um, right now it's great. I mean, the friends I'm making, uh, the connections I'm making, while not bringing cash and prizes, I think are going to last a lifetime. And, you know, uh, I, I'm just, 
you know, very honored to be um, meeting the people I'm meeting. I mean, uh, by stepping forward, um, I didn't know what was going to happen. I said I wanted to be a lightning rod. And a lot of people thought that meant that they'd come after me, whoever they are. But what, what ended up happening is people like me are coming towards me and I'm finding them. Whereas, you know, if I just stayed silent, I'd be alone, I'd feel alone. And I don't feel alone anymore. There's so many of us out there. It's amazing. Uh, more than we think. More than we think. Well, Ed, this has been amazing. I really deeply appreciate your time and energy and your forthrightness on everything. And may you continue to be a beacon of light for others. I Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll get to connect again as this all unfolds. Absolutely. And I appreciate your time. And thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you. And I really respect what you do and uh, how, you, how you are in the world. It's, uh, you, you also are an example to me. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ed.